All right, as we have seen, if we take this function, which I, again, I'm informally calling the, the deviation from the expected value, and if we try to ask what is the average deviation, we're gonna end up with an answer of zero for precisely the reasons that I just gave. So rather than ask what is the spread in quotes, we're gonna ask now what is the variance not in quotes. And the reason for that is this is a very well-defined and a very useful function for us. And the way that we're gonna define this now properly is as follows. We're going to say that instead of calculating this, the average of that deviation, we're gonna calculate the average of that squared. Yeah. I'm hesitating because, it, yeah, I, I'm gonna write it a little bit more properly. I'm gonna use the proper symbol that we actually use for this. I'm gonna write sigma squared, which is in fact what we call the variance. So sigma squared is exactly defined as this. And all we have to do now is take our definition for that delta J, square it, and then average it. And to do that, to find the average of that, we use back to our, our formula that we had before, the, the expectation value of any function, and that any function now is going to be this thing with a square on it. So I, I hope you see where all the pieces are kind of falling into place here. And this is also why I have given the preface that at this point, if things aren't really clicking, it's really important to stop and make sure they click before we go on. So we're, we're, you should probably be, you know, beginning to make just a direct, you know, like, I don't want to call it an equation sheet, but just something that you can briefly glance at to remember, oh, hey, what was this formula for that? Or what was the formula for P of J or something? So what we're going to do now is we're going to take that defining formula for anything with brackets around it, and we're going to use it. <laughs> uh, we're going to take that guy, J minus, uh, oops, J minus expecta the expectation value of J squared times probability of J. And again, all of that, I mean, it's it, by the a lot by the laws of addition, uh, summation. All of that is within the sigma. You can't. None of these are constants, or at least that's not a constant. And this changes, of course, as j changes. So from here on out, we're just going to use the whatever the uh, binomial binomial distribution, and then we're going to tack on that probability of j for each of those terms. So this is going to be a little bit of busy work, but at this point here. What I encourage you to do is to pause the video and work this out entirely for yourself. Um, it is something that you should be able to do. So I, obviously I'll go ahead and do it here, but get as far as you can because there is a nice, easy way to write this in the end that I want for you to see how, how you achieve it. So I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of um, somewhat quickly do this. I'm not gonna so much explain myself. I'm just gonna use basic laws of algebra here. So just use the binomial distribution. Now I'm gonna distribute the probability to each of those. So what I've done here is just added that probability of the, the probability to each individual factor. Now, one thing to note, and this is really important. As we mentioned before, whenever you see the expectation value, that's a constant. That's already been calculated for your distribution. So specifically, what I can do here is on the last term, for example, I can pull that out in front of that summation. Because in, in our case, it's 10.05. 10.05, each time, the only thing that changes is the probability. And then same thing here. And I already kind of used that. I've already pulled that constant two out front and I just as easily could have pulled that expectation value of J out front there. So I'm gonna rewrite this now, and I'm probably gonna to have to use the rest of the space, but that's fine. Okay, so now, just pulling out anything that was a constant, we're getting something that's, ah, uh, shoot. <laughs> Actually, not that bad. I just forgot one of the J's there. So I, I can only pull out that expectation value of J, but from that cross term, we do have a J inside the summation. 
Um, now, so this is a, a really useful point now, because, uh, yeah, we'll talk about it and then I'll, I'll have to erase it. Um, but at this point here, this is going to be a, a well-defined function. It's a moment function of j squared. This thing here, you know precisely what that is. That's what we have already called j, the expectation value j, sorry. And you also know precisely what this is here. If you add up all the probabilities of everything happening, you're guaranteed something has happened. One. So again, if you, if you weren't able to quite get this far, at this point here, now you should be able to get the final result. So let's go ahead and erase this and let's actually define what the final variance is. Like my marker. Okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and define, or not define, but I'm just gonna go ahead and rewrite everything that we have here, and I'm gonna basically use exactly what I just described in words to much more efficiently write all of this. So that first term is simply the expectation value of j squared. The second term is minus two times expected value of j times expected value of j. Now, well, I'll come back to this in a second, but those two things are not the same. And I will give one, one easy example to see that. And then finally, that last term is j squared times one. And we can pretty clearly see this is basically minus two blah plus blah. So this just becomes j squared expected value minus expected value of j squared. And where I said that word squared is very important because that's the difference between these. And this is exactly what we define as our variance sigma squared. It's the variance of a function. I should really say it's the variance of a distribution. And I will say that. It's a variance of a distribution function. Now, real quickly, let's, let me just give you one other example here. Um, and let's, let's have a case where here is our data set. Um, you have one student who is age one, one student who is age three. Now, if we take the expected value of j squared. So this is j, this is n of j. And this is just to prove the point that those two are not always the same. So if you take, actually let's do this. What is the uh, expected value of j here? So the expected value of j is literally just the average of them. So the expected value of j here is just 1 times 1 plus 1 times 3 divided by 2. Or you didn't even need to really think about that because you already know the average of 1 and 3 is 2. So clearly, that thing squared is 4. On the other hand, and, and I, I'll write this out a little bit more definitely though, the other function that we have, the expected value of j squared, is going to be found by taking 1 squared, or 1, plus 3 squared, or 9, divided by the total number 2. So here we have a case where the expected value of j squared is 5, whereas the expected value of j, comma, squared is 4. Um, I, I challenge you to, like, you know, write this out and directly calculate these, these two things if you don't believe me. But in this direct example here, we can immediately see that those two are not the same. And as a general rule, unless we have an extremely exceptional function, those two will almost never be the same. So what we end up having now is a well-defined function that we know will never be, well, uh, this is a a bit more of a stretch, and I'm not going to prove this, but 
We know this will never be negative because Tony said so. Um, and, and actually, I think Griffiths does talk a little bit about that. Um, so this will always be a positive function. You can just trust me on that, or you can prove it to yourself. And specifically, this is the measure that we were looking for. This variance will tell us, on average, how far the numbers deviate from the median, or, or sorry, the expected value, squared. This thing is a really important quantity to be, able, to be able to know how to calculate. And everything I've done in getting there, you don't need to like repeat that exact same calculation every time. Because typically you can take a distribution and you can just have a, a calculator, for example, it knows how to calculate that thing. It knows how to calculate that thing and then square it. So you don't necessarily need to know how to do that, but the process of getting there is super important because it really kind of confirms how we can manipulate these somewhat strange creatures in a meaningful way. And finally, the thing that, that most of us are taught is the best measure of how spread out a function is, is what we call the standard deviation. And what I'm going to write here The standard deviation, the statistically well-defined quantity, is literally just the square root of the variance. <laughs> and given that the variance we're writing very conveniently is sigma squared, is just sigma. And let me give you an example on a continuous function here. So we're going to create a bell curve or a Gaussian. and the way that we formally define this, which is actually a really good example problem to work, if you look at what the, um, what the and I will write this, um, this function here is given by some constant times e to the minus x squared over 2 sigma. That's the proper definition of a Gaussian function. And I'm intentionally not telling you what that A is, not just because I don't remember it, I actually do remember it, um, but the, we, this is a, a really good homework problem to do. So this is the proper definition of a Gaussian function. Um, by the way, this is assuming it's centered at x equals zero. Um, if you want to center it somewhere else, you just say x minus x naught squared. Now, I don't know why I'm writing so small, but I, I hope you can see that. So anyway, it's x or, or x minus the, the center point squared over, the important thing is 2 sigma. And what that 2 sigma tells us is on either side, the average distance is going to be sigma to the left or sigma to the right. Or more precisely, if you total the area under this Gaussian, and by the way, I didn't actually plan on talking about this, but, but we're already doing it. If you take the integral specifically of the area under this peak here within one sigma in either direction, you get 68% of all the data points, and that extra 32% is evenly divided on those tails there. So this is, it's a very, very well-defined statistical quantity, and this sigma right there is precisely the sigma that you get when you take the square root of this. So this kind of puts everything together in terms that, that you have probably heard before, but hopefully at a higher level and using funkier notation. All right, so what I want to do now is, it, we've done a lot of the kind of the grunt work here. What I want to do now is move on to talking about a function over a continuous variable, recognizing full well that you might be mentally exhausted, uh, because I am. So let's do it anyway.